Muskogee. I do appreciate this fall. I know that I'm speaking for Joyce and Gary, Don and MR. I know I'm speaking for every man involved in the staff of the National Farmers Organization. It, it, was, a, it was a tough fall. We had men running day and night, and we had men running every day delivering cattle. And it was definitely a loose ends type when we started. And these guys pulled it together and made it work. Now it's up to you to make that thing continue and perform better this coming year. That's really all I wanted to say about the feeder cattle division. It really is that simple. You've got the most lucrative possibility of any cattle company in the United States. You've got the firm ability to be able to make it the largest that exists if you'll put your production into it. Now we've got another department that I'm equally as responsible for as the feeder division. That's the sheep and lamb department. We have the director of that department, Dick Hammond, is here and he's from Ogden, Utah. Dick's got the same problem with the sheep department, if you call it a problem, that we have in every other commodity. We gotta have more production. You can take Dick's contracted lamb prices this fall, you can compare them anywhere you want to compare them, and you'll find that he's exercised a premium on, I believe, each and every sale the man made. I have not had one complaint called to me, at least, about the price and the movement and the handling of the sheep commodities this fall. There's only one reason for that. That's damn good directorship of those, of those lambs. We have got, though, to have the exact same kind of participation from the membership on the lambs as we do on the feeder cattle. This lamb department, I will say this, I gave total commitment to the board of directors, the lamb department would increase 100%. Now, I'm going to stand on that. Dick says we can do it. Dick says that with one reservation. It takes your participation. He's got his program. He's got as good a rapport with the buying interest in the lamb community as any one man in the United States. He has the contacts. He has the people wanting to do the business with you. He's got to have your lambs blocked in order to carry it out. When he asks for your help, and if you're in the lamb community, you're derelict in your duty to this organization not to give it to him. And I would hope that you extend that courtesy to him so he can exercise the professionalism that he's grew, uh, grew up with over the last 30, 25 years. With that, I want to introduce Dick Hammond to you. Gentlemen, I, I want to say one thing. Uh, some of you cattlemen that are leaving may want to take this into consideration. As far as government grading is concerned in the sheep division, I don't want to see one of them. I put up with 13 years of it, and there is no negotiation. When he says you're out, you're out. You don't go to the buyer and say, we just threw one out over here, why don't you take one in on this side? Uh, you stand there, and if he says, I don't like that cat, I don't like that steer, I don't like that lamb, that's the way the ball goes. I don't want to hand any more of our freedom, and if, if NFO can't stand behind what they sort and what they put up, then doggone it, there's something wrong with the way we're doing business. I don't have trouble that way. I do know this much, that I don't send Monta Vista lambs, possibly, to the same buyer that I send a West Slope lamb to, because it's a little bit at sometimes I don't send Holsteins on a Black Baldy order. And I don't send a certain type of, of, of lamb to one man that I know doesn't want that kind. Now that's what you call experience. That's called judgment. And you get good judgment from experience. But experience comes from bad judgment. That's what that feeder rep's there. 
and some of the people that get up and complain about the grading, the minute the situation is in turn, somebody, the, the feeder rep says, oh, oh, I don't like that one, we better pull it out. The gentleman says, I don't think that's the right kind of a grade. Where are the rest of them? They beat a retreat into the scale house or go get the coffee. They don't want any part of it. That's going to be a bad deal. But by the same token, when it's that bad deal, that reflects on that whole load of cattle, which is you're very much a part of. Now, the sheep division, as far as we're concerned, we're there. Yeah. I listened when I first came into NFO, moan and groan, we're never competitive, we never get enough money, we don't do this, we don't do that, we, never, we can't go to our neighbor, we can't do anything for him because we're, not, we're under the local market. Well, I'll tell you some stories on this then. This sheep division is not under the local market. We lead the way most everywhere that we have any volume to work with. And we are in a situation where men on the staff that works with me, nobody works for me, everybody works with me, and I work with them. And we work with you, and that's why we come up with a team and an organization. We've got men that have delivered into hundreds of thousands of lambs, and they've never had a buyer in that corral. The buyer's never been there for the way up. He writes the draft, sends him, uh, calls it into him, tells him to send the money to Minneapolis. You people may, might as well make up your mind. Don't kid yourself. Now, there's two ways we're going to do this. We're going to do it the NFO way, or we're going to do it their way. Now, you might as well, there's no kidding about it. Now, you're either going to do it the NFO system, or you are going to do it his system. Now, the NFO system is designed to assist you. The other system is designed to glean as much profit from trading with you as possible. That's simple. Now, the sheep division has got everything but one point put together. And that point is, I can't sign the contract for sale for you people. I can't. Isn't that something? I can do all of these things. I can get all this program rolling, prices, administration, finances, sorting, delivery, acceptance by the industry, but I lack one thing. I lack the sheep. And where does the sheep come from? Or where does the cattle, that matter? Yeah. How many of you people walked in here today? And I'm sure every one of you. How many bid, how many bid on their... On their uh, how many uh, told the people at the motel or the hotel how much they pay for a room? Raise your hand, please. How many went over there and bought a hot dog and they said 80 cents and you said, I'll give six bits? Don't work, does it? How come we're that? How, how come somebody can get 80 cents for a hot dog and we almost have to sell a whole hog for it? <laughs> okay, so this situation is no joke as far as I'm concerned. When we talk about staff, California was a good area. One time the old boy that was out there uh, with me that has just passed away and a heck of a good NFO member, or a, a, a good staff member, worked, worked hard in all areas for us. We were sitting down and figuring out how much money were we plowing into the NFO program. Now there's just two of us. I took a part-time thing, took his full salary and expenses and the whole works, and we come up with about $15,000 that NFO was spending in staff expenses out there. Then we figured up the amount of buyers at the same rate that we were, and I'll tell you one thing, on two and a half dollars a day, that don't pay the, the, the bottle opening bill for those guys, let alone the booze. And they turn around and we figured it out, we were up against about 10, 12 guys on a break-even basis before they ever made a profit, and we were facing in the neighborhood of $150,000 worth of opposite direction for those guys to be out living motels, paying their bills, going out, traveling around the country, shaking hands, asking you what your inventory is. Oh, and you people are great at inventory. <laughs> oh, buyer calls you up, how's the kids? He get, drives up, pats the dog on, gives a little candy bar to one of the kids, and how's your, uh, how's your crop? Oh, you tell them how many ewes you got, how many twins you got, what kind of range you got, how many fat you got, when you're gonna come off. Come off. And if he can't get it from you, he calls up your neighbor. And he gives it to them. You're the only people that I know 
that play ball by delivering their game plan to the opposite team before we start. And when an NFO man comes along and wants to get a solid contract, he wants to get a solid commitment, he wants to get an inventory, man, man, he looks like a lost relative that's come to claim the family jewels. Oh, oh watch out for that guy. Don't sign that paper. Oh, sir. Well, you're looking at a little guy behind this podium that has the privilege, due to you people out there, that represents the largest single land block in the United States. He also represents the only national sheep program in the United States. And he's got that situation because you people have given the support to do it. Now let's go just a little bit to bargaining, because this is where it all happens. We can talk the talk and walk the walk around here. I've listened to enough talk here that I, we could sink the Titanic once a week. Boy, the bottom line is to me is on that contract for sale and I get that inventory. Now, in a situation we have in California, we had two def definite areas in California. One was an area where the boys were tough, tight, exacting, county orientated, had their meat chairman going, and man, when you went in there, you, they, you felt like a turkey just before Thanksgiving. But that was all right. They asked the right questions, they wanted the answers, and once we had them, then there was no problem. We had another area that says, well, we'll call you when we get ready, we'll, we'll let you know, and they did. They went through the program, or whatever program they decided they wanted to go through, or told our man that they wanted. But I'll tell you, the one that had the county structure, the one that had the meat chairman, we contracted those lambs and got top prices for them, good deliveries, money on hand. The other organization today, because the man that administrated that contract suddenly got sick and died, there is, you can't even find it. So I'm telling you, this county structure has got to be there. To give you an example of what interchanging of bargaining is concerned, I'm in Colorado. I'm over there and I got a load of ewes. And I've, met, and I've gone to one of these meetings, got them all hyped up, boy, get your ewes put together, we're gonna get you a price. I make about two or three telephone calls and I'm telling you it's dead. And I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm dragging my feet back to the meeting because I've gotta go back and say, boys, I've just given you this big talk the talk, but now that it comes to walk the walk, I can't do a thing. And in the meantime, I thought, well, I'll delay a little bit. So I stopped in the cafe, had a cup of coffee, and made a call to the home office. Well, fortunately, Sunken was on the phone. And he said, uh, we got to talk, and I said, yeah, I just called out on the West Coast. And this is when hogs were about 65 cents a pound. Glenn Luff will remember this one. And uh, uh, ewes were about 12, 13, 14 cents a pound. We would turn around, I called the guy, and he had turned me down flat. So I said, boy, I just had to call from that same guy. And he said he'd just give anything for a couple loads of hogs. I said, why don't you do this? Why don't you just call him back? Tell him he's got two loads of hogs, but he takes one load of ewes. That's what you call collective bargaining, because we sold them. Fella, when I call him up to make the appointment on the ewes, you'd think I was a long lost relative. I'm a rich one at that. Now this year, we had a situation. We've sold lambs to a guy quite a number of lambs, up close to 100,000 lambs. And all of a sudden we had a couple of fellows that signed in their contract for sale, but they put enough stipulations in it that if you could, if you could get it open, if you could get it open without a can opener, or a, you needed more like a double-bladed ax. So they, they rode along and finally they sold at the same price that our block sold for. But by the same token, when that happened, this, they sold to the same buyer. And I called up on the phone, didn't get mad, didn't call him just exactly what I thought he should be called. I just said, you know, I've always, always, always thought that you were one of the top-notch, brightest young men in this business. Oh, he says, why, thank you. But I said, I've had to change my mind. He says, well, what, what caused that? I said, I, it's hard for me to equate something close to 100,000 lambs against 3,500. You know those two that I'm talking about over there in Colorado? A little silence. He says, how much do you want? I says, 50 cents a head. He said, he's sending it to us. 
That's exactly collective bargaining. Because I just had to remind him that we have 100,000 lambs. Well, if he wants to fool around on the outside edge for 3,500, it's his choice, isn't it? I didn't tell him what to do. And I'm not going to tell him what to do. The only difference is he will not be on the preferred list of customers for next year. Do you think that makes a difference to him? You better believe it makes a difference to him. And the only reason it makes a difference to him is because we represent enough volume to be able to make that man sit up and take notice. If we were sitting out here with two or three thousand lambs, you think it would worry him? Not one bit. And he didn't send me 50 cents ahead or send 50 cents ahead because, you know, he liked NFO or he was particularly in love with me. But he knew that he had made a mistake and he didn't want to antagonize this particular organization. And it was better for him to pay part of the check off rather than to go along and let us have a bad feeling over somebody that decided to play both ends against the middle and he fell heir to it. We've had a situation in Dixon, California, same way, collective bargaining. And we're going to get this thing quit. Collective bargaining in Dixon, California. We had a buyer who wouldn't take, would make a move. Because remember, folks, the closer you are to your buyer, the worse off you are. You know why? Because it costs a dollar and a half to bring from someplace else and only costs 50 cents. So some way we got to figure you, like they do with the gas and the railroad and the whole works, we got to have you pay a uh, half of that freight from out there because you're close and it don't cost you. And then we can give them all the same amount of money only you're pay they, they can pay a little more money out there because you're picking up part of the freight the closer you are to that, that plant. Most people don't believe that, but I know. And that's a fact. This guy would not move. All of a sudden, I just called him up. And he said, uh, I said, well, he said, I'd sure like to buy that block of lambs. I said, we'll take 46 cents. He says, my God, Dick, I can buy lambs for 42 cents by myself blind. I says, well, get your dark glasses on and start. So here's all these wonderful people. Now, he called the NFO block, but we, fortunately, we went on the, on the telephone, and we called and told these people what to expect. Now, the NFO members, we didn't. So here's a great saving saint down here. He goes out and buys all his true good buddies' lambs at 42 to 43 cents and cleans up every lamb that's not on contract. So the next morning I, call, I, I, I said, you can call me, I'll be at the airport. He says, well, uh, so he calls me, he says, Dick, I can't give that kind of money. I said, dude, that's okay. Did you get some lamb? Oh yeah, I got so-and-so, so-and-so. I said, great, wonderful, good for you. And he says, where are you going to get that? I says, do you know where Sioux Falls, South Dakota is? And he's in California. You know, the California, they, most people in California ask Art Wilson. They don't know there's any other state. They're just like the Texans. So I says, I said, do you know where South Dakota is? And he says, yeah, Sioux Falls? I said, yeah. He says, well, we're, they're giving 50 cents for lambs in Sioux Falls. And I happen to have a trucking situation here in front of me that it takes four bucks to go to Sioux Falls. Now, if I equate correctly, that's 46 cents, isn't it? He said, yeah. I said, you want them or don't you? He said, I'll take them. Now, that wasn't telling them how poor, the, how much the organization needed the money, how this poor sheep grower out there has got 10 kids and 12 of them are in the hospital and all that sort of thing. No way, no sob story, no nothing, just cold turkey, buddy. Do you want them or not? Because if you don't, I'm going to move them out to South Dakota. Now, I'd much rather sell them to you because we'd like to have your plant make a little money. We'd like to have it stay in business. We don't want to, we're not here to put you out of business. We're here to see that you get an opportunity. And the only time that a buyer can come to me with a legitimate gripe is when he doesn't have an opportunity to bid. But just like this buyer here that decided to go around and help a couple of our, our so-called members start to fragmentate our block, I let him know, boy, go ahead, it's your privilege. I'm not here to dictate. I'm just here to remind you of what I'm here for, and that's to be just exactly what you folks have hired me to do, and that's be a collective bargainer for you. And then the, I can't repeat it because the ladies are here. Uh, I have another name. 
we have this kind of a situation. And this is what it's going to take. It's going to take that missing link, and the missing link sits out here. You put me up here, you'll take me down. I was in Omaha right up, this, right up the river here, and I, put, I went into Omaha with 8% of the receipts. When I left Omaha, we did 43%. You know why I left Omaha? Because the buyers got smart. When we used to have the terminal market, and we established the price, and they couldn't buy me off, what did they do? They went out into the country and saw you direct. Any one of you that think you can sit around and spar with a guy that's in training 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're nuts. I'm just saying this, that we got sheep men that spend 364 days on the mountain and come down and one day they're going to climb in the ring. They can climb in, but I know they're going to be carried out. And it happens year after year. My job is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months of the year. How's the market? Here's what it is. Now hang up the phone, count to 10, call me back, and it's different. That's the way this market is. We're trying to now, at this moment in time, put stability in there. Now I'm going to close this thing with this much. The cattlemen, the cattle buyers have to deal, and cattle coordinators have to deal with this type of a buyer. He's a fellow that follows an NFO member through a revolving door and comes out ahead of him. And then the sheep man has got another group. He's a fellow that follows an NFO member through the revolving door and the member doesn't come out at all. Thank you. came to the organization, he came over and stayed at our house there in western Colorado and I had the privilege of helping Dick put together the first lamb block that he ever sold for NFO. Got a lot of admiration for Dick. I'm here representing the volume division and this was put together in June by the administration with the thought in mind that we need a division that would procure all livestock for the organization. Rather than sending four or five men up and down the road, we need one set of people that will do the procurement end of it. The technical part of it fall back to Gary, fall back to the hog division, the fat cattle division, and to Dick here when it comes to actually moving the product, bargaining for it, putting it together, sorting it, and moving it. We're interested in getting that signature and helping Dick what he's talking about. He's got a problem that he can't cope with. He can't sign the contract. We're going to see if we can't help him sign that contract. I mean, that's what our division is about. In June, they called in and put together the 16 best people that we had working in the meat department from all divisions. And I've been privileged to work with those guys in putting this volume structure together. We've divided the United States up into regions. We've put, plugged those regions into the computer for pay purposes back to the commission people for record keeping as to what's going on market wise and so forth. I've been working with those guys since July. We now have the country covered basically from Ohio to the Rockies, from Wisconsin to the Gulf. We're getting a good chunk of this United States covered. I would hope next year to come back and tell you people that we had it all covered in any region where there's enough product to support a man. That's what this program is about. I'm not going to go through the full outline. There's one thing I will say you people that are in a collection point area. The thing we're going to stress and the thing Dick brought out in his talk in an area like California, what made one area successful and another not succeed was his meat committees. This is something we're going to be talking about a whole lot during the next year is the structuring of the meat committee and getting them to help these regional supervisors put this program together. We've got to use the meat committee. The local people have to be involved. Bob Arndt said it. It's you and me. We're the only ones who can make it work. If we're going to stay out here, keep these family farms going, and turn them over to our next generation, it's you and me out here. And that's what we're about, is to get this involvement through the regional supervisors I have a list of who those guys are, I can tell you offhand, but if you're not familiar with who they are in your region, contact either myself, Walt Hackney, or Cecil Conrad. Along parallel to that, 
Cecil Connery will be handling the collection point end of this, dealing with any problem there is at a collection point or assisting them in getting an operator for that collection point, help them to structure a meet committee at that collection point. Whatever involves that collection point is where Cecil will be working. He's in the home office, he's working with us. This is a whole new division that was set up in July and it is working for all departments. I want you people to be familiar with that. One thing I'd like to say, I would hope that by next year, we don't have a collection point man left that makes contacts in the country. Now that's a little contrary to what you people have heard before. I would hope that you people go home and structure enough meat departments that we keep that guy busy running project at the collection point to where he never has time to get out of it. Then we've got success. And that's what this is about, and that's the reason we came with the volume division to accomplish this, to put that man on a paying basis. We've already got a lot of the collection points running two and three days a week, that six months ago were running one day a week. This has been a big step forward. We're a service organization, we've got to remember this. We're here to service the member. The more service we offer him, if it's in the form of running more days a week or whatever it is, the better off we are. I think that's enough of this probably for this type of meeting. I enjoyed visiting with you people and thank you for the opportunity, Gary. Thank you, Glenn.